thank you to our session sponsor, New Hope Fertility Center, for making this session possible. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Helen Adrian, a psychotherapist in private practice since 1979. Although a general therapist, she has specialized in working with people dealing with infertility. Helen is trained in mind-body therapy and clinical hypnotherapy and conducts mind-body stress reduction classes at NYU Fertility Center. Welcome. Okay, so I have one minute and I wanna give you the essence of what my work is about, which is that A, you can learn to reverse the physiology of stress, stress being the key word when you're dealing with infertility. I don't have to tell anyone that. By reuniting mind, body, spirit. And secondly, you can tell the apothecary up here that you can replace cortisol with endorphins, and that you have control over that. And the third thing is that with hypnosis, you can learn to open up your unconscious mind so that it takes in post-hypnotic suggestions. It's very powerful. Um, this has been my passion for 34 years because it allows me to use my professional skills to teach people how to reclaim control, how to partner with your medical team so that you don't feel like a subject, and how to grow from adversity while you wait for your miracle. And uh, at this point, I would like to introduce the uh, the other panelists, and uh, I was told that I had to be a bit of a Gestapo person, so you have two minutes to say, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be reminded that the two minutes is up. Um, we have here Dr. Lyndon Chang, who is a board-certified fellow of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a member of the American a medical association, senior medical associate at New Hope Fertility, and I'm particularly thrilled to be introducing him and his work because over 34 years I have noticed that less can be more. And um, Jill Blakeway, uh, clinical director of the Yin Ova Center, licensed and board certified acupuncturist and her herbalist. Uh, the New York Times calls her the fertility goddess, which is a nice <laughs> thing. Um, she has written two books, Making Babies and Sex Again, and she's had the honor of being invited to do a TED Talk, uh, which is a huge prestige. And I can personally attest to Jill's skills. And we have Anat, who is a former patient and is willing to share her story with this audience. So I'm watching the clock go. Very good. So <laughs> You know, we come to a conference like this, and you see all this wonderful technology in the field of reproductive medicine. But what's so fascinating is that there's, there are women patients out there, couples out there, that are very reluctant to move on to IVF, even though they failed multiple, uh, multiple courses and treatments involving inseminations or intercourse. Now, why is this? Well, the public perception of IVF is that it's overly aggressive, overly invasive, overly expensive. It has lots of complications, lots of side effects. And you know what? The public is pretty much right on this. And the, and the, and the medical community really hasn't done much to try to change this. Uh, we're looking at, so what are, what are we afraid of? Well, I guess I, here, I have a slide on this. So what are we afraid of? What you're going to see is we have IVF. This is what everybody knows as IVF a pile of medications, two, three, four injections a day, uh, uh, 20, 30 injections through a whole cycle, adding thousands of dollars to whatever's already expensive, expensive process, creating, a, oh, we have a clicker. Taking what you see is a single follicle on a, on a normal ovary and driving it to, as you see in the bottom picture, basically creating a, a follicle factory, an egg machine and in the process creating side effects, nausea, bloating, headaches, uh, pain, discomfort, and in worst case scenario, something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which I'm not gonna go into right now. Uh, this is going to require general anesthesia to get these eggs out, and you have a laundry list of complications. So, a small group of doctors came up with the idea that does it really necessary have to be like this? Doctors like Dr. Samukatu in Japan my partner, Dr. John Zhang, uh, they're thinking to themselves, 
Look, the first IVF was one egg, uh, natural IVF. We know that 95% of the eggs that are created from these high stimulation protocols are useless. So can't we cut down on the medications and still keep the same efficiency? And that's where these low stimulation protocols came from. And that's what my center does. Uh, we were one of the first centers in the United States to, to do these on a regular basis. And we're still one of the few centers there for some reason. And we'll and get we'll more on this in your yeah. next five minutes. Jill. I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, hello, I'm Jill Blakeway. I am the clinic director and the founder of the UNOVA Center here in New York City. We are a large complementary medicine practice. We're actually the largest Chinese medicine practice in the United States. And back in 2009, which feels like a long time ago now, I wrote a book called Making Babies. And um, so we're very well known for our fertility specialty. Um, it's not all we do, however. We do actually treat everybody from teeny tiny babies with colic to senior citizens with arthritis. Us. But everybody at the UNOVA Center treats male and female infertility, and we have done for many, many years. Uh, we have 10 acupuncturists. Uh, we're open seven days a week to support our IVF patients, because as you know, <laughs> Dr. Chang, they need treatment when they need treatment. Um, we have a nutritionist whose job it is to craft very specific um, fertility diets for people with specific fertility diagnoses. We have a naturopath. We have a lovely support group and um, a, a fertility coach who's actually here today, and a yoga teacher and a specialized massage therapist. So we have lots of options. They're not supposed to be burdensome, and we help you navigate between them. And Hi, um, I'm Inat. I'm a former patient of Dr. Zen and Dr. Jang, Chang. Um, I came uh, to New Hope Fertility uh, Center after going through regular IVF uh, with um, a history of three miscarriages. And after I was told that uh, most likely um, I won't be able to have my own children and I should consider either an egg donor or an adoption, uh, I started my treatments at a new fertility center. Um, I had gone through four cycles and finally got pregnant with my first child. Uh, six months later, I decided that I would like to uh, have a, another chance to have a second child. I started, um, I started banking. Uh, I was 41 already, 41 years old. I started banking uh, embryos. And two years later, um, I had um, my, uh, my second child. So um, I'm thankful for New Hope Fertility uh, for helping me uh, having my, the, 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 most, the most beautiful uh, gift that I can ever have. So in five minutes, what we would like from you, uh, Dr. Chang, is to help people understand how they would be appropriate patients for your type of treatment. How do you decide who is appropriate for that? And um, uh, what is the evidence that helps you decide uh, you know, how you would accept a patient and, and give her what she needs? At, at our center, we think that all patients, uh, th that this is a reasonable option for all patients. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that we're, we are not necessarily saying that this is better than what's conventionally there. But what mm -hmm. we're saying is that, look, with these lower stimu stimulation protocols, you don't have to be sick and, you, well, you don't have to stab yourself multiple times a day. You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of extra additional dollars that are not covered. Uh, you don't have to go through the side effects that are there. You don't have to go through the risk of retrieving the eggs, the, the nausea, the bloating, the possible risk of aspiration. The, you don't have to have the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, where even if you're successfully pregnant, you could still have to worry about losing an ovary, losing a pregnancy, even losing your life in very rare circumstances. Uh, mm -hmm. These lower stimulation protocols, obviously the, the benefits are, are very obvious, less medications, uh, mm -hmm. less expense, uh, less follicles, less side effects. Uh, the possibility of doing this under local anesthesia under, as opposed to general anesthesia, which is much, much, uh, much, much safer. And also, when you're doing the transfers, you're not worried about feeling miserable and horrible and worrying about ovarian hyperstimulation. You know, your body is more natural, and natural mm -hmm. is better, lower is better. So you can do a retrieval without anesthesia? Yes, well, we, we use local anesthesia, and, and the reason we can do this is we have, we're dealing with smaller amount of follicles, fewer amount of follicles, mm -hmm. and obviously less is less painful. Mm -hmm. uh, our center also, because of our techniques, we, we do this on, I wake patients every day, so that, uh, 
Mm -hmm. Obviously, if someone is performing retrievals on general anesthesia with a patient who's totally asleep, mm -hmm. uh, their technique is not going to transfer to someone who's awake necessarily. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is very unique to us is we do have a retrieval catheter, retrieval needle, that is mm -hmm. designed specifically for us, that we are mm -hmm. unique to us, 50% mm -hmm. smaller than everything else in the United States, and obviously smaller is less uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, so, what we're, you know, once again, the, the idea is that this is not necessarily, we're not going to say statistically it's better because the data is not out there yet. You know, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's been the big issue with ours, mm -hmm. uh, with, with our technique. Where is the data? Where is the evidence? Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, I don't know why, but many centers are not interested in creating the evidence. You know, you can't have evidence without someone creating it. And, you know, maybe it's because many centers are very comfortable with their success. Maybe many centers are comfortable, are uncomfortable uh, with taking a chance with that success. Mm -hmm. Or maybe some centers have tried it once or twice before they've been able to really optimize the technique, mm -hmm. and they failed, so they decided to give up. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the data that's coming out of this is coming out of overseas, where not only is it accepted, but it's these lower stimulation protocols are being embraced. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the next six to twelve months, I wouldn't be surprised if in our center, in in the United States here, that we'll hear of a major paper coming out from a major center showing that these lower stimulation protocols are a reasonable option. Mm -hmm to conventional high protocol. And I know that uh, evidence-based is the way of the world these yeah. days in my own field. We yeah. have to provide the research and whatnot that yeah. backs up mind-body techniques yeah. and hypnosis techniques and whatnot. So and what's so difficult is that someone has to create the evidence, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's what's mm -hmm. so difficult about evidence-based. Yeah. If, if no one is there to create it, there is no advancement. There's yeah. no scientific innovation. Yeah. Well, in my field, somebody said, why, why are they bothering us with all this evidence-based, you know? The evidence about a parachute is if it opens or not, you know? And mm -hmm. these patients are happy with what they get, and, uh, but anecdotal doesn't seem to fly as much. So, mm -hmm. But it's good news yeah. that they're coming out of Europe with this yeah. new so, information. So in we, have, we have just another couple okay. seconds. So in, a, in, a, in, a, so in the end, you know, even if the data even if there's evidence that shows that this may not be as efficient as conventional IDF, which I think the judgment's still out, yeah. because it's lower, less, it's less invasive, it's less aggressive, and it's less expensive, this is maybe a better option for many, many people mm -hmm. out there. I've seen it be very effective with women who are flirting with 40 and beyond. Yeah. Um, uh, Jill? Yes. So, um, just following on from you, actually, when, when I wrote Making Babies, I chose to write it with a reproductive endocrinologist. And the reason I did that is because I believe that you, our patients, want the best of all possible worlds. I don't think you want to be completely alternative, most of you. I think um, what, ha and this is true for me too, when I want medical care, what we want is the best that Western science has to offer us without being over-medicated, which is where you come mm -hmm. in, actually. Mm -hmm. And the uh, wisdom of Eastern medicine, any wisdom that we can have that helps us to conceive as naturally as possible. That that's really, I think, what I was aiming at with, with Making mm -hmm. Babies, which is a three-month program to maximize fertility. And um, one of the gratifying things, actually, when I go on Amazon is there's hundreds of five-star reviews now. And so many people say, I did what they said, and I got pregnant. Now, not everybody will get pregnant doing a three-month program from a book, of course. But lots of people do, because actually doing natural things and, and adopting mm -hmm. a fertility-friendly mm -hmm. lifestyle is yeah. important. And the people who don't get pregnant have prepared themselves to do IVF, and they stand more chance of having a successful yeah. IVF um, because they've invested some time mm -hmm. and some effort <coughs> into um, getting a, a, what I call a fertility-friendly sort of lifestyle going. Yeah, and lifestyle the, is the key word. Yes, and what is. I would what I would be interested in because I deal with people yeah. who need to change their lifestyle as well, and it's very difficult because you have a job, you have run your house, you have the job of fertility. And then people like us come along and say, here's another job. All you have to do is this food and this way of <laughs> don't drink, don't, ugh, right? So, and, but, but you I'm, know, it's simple in some ways, Helen, because yeah. it all comes down to balance. Um, you know, in, in making babies, uh, there are, um, uh, it, there are, 
fertility types and you do a little quiz and you find your fertility type and you follow a diet for your fertility type. In my practice, we have nutritionists and she'll give you a really specific fertility diet. But the truth is that a, a healthy, well-balanced diet is great for you. And the people who have trouble getting pregnant, in my experience, are the ones who are missing a food group, you know, my low-fat um, dieters. You do need fat to make reproductive hormones. Dr. Chang will tell you, you do need fat. Um, <laughs> my Atkins dieters sometimes have problems. You do actually need carbohydrates. Some right. of us have too many, but you do need some. Uh, and so really it's about balance. And um, uh, what I, that's what I usually tell people, and that's really what this book is about. Mm -hmm. We did create separate types of advice for different types of people. So there's a type called the stuck type who are estrogen yeah. dominant. And those people get fibroids and PMS and things like that. We would advise them not to have soy or any kind of soy products. We'd like them to have lots of leafy green vegetables, that kind of thing. But then we have people who we call the dry type in the book. And those people are low in estrogen. It's OK for them to have some plant estrogens, maybe some gentle ones like flaxseed, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There isn't a one size fits all for all fertility patients. And when you read on the internet about a herb and you think you should take it, I would like, I would like you to remember that I said this. <laughs> not, there isn't such a thing as a fertility herb. There are herbs that treat specific things, and it may not be the right herb for you. And so it's really worth seeing a herbalist or someone who knows what they're doing and getting a program put together that, that's just for you. OK. And Aina? Um, so um, I actually want to support uh, Dr. Ching's uh, theory about the, the less, the more. Uh, when I was going through uh, regular IVF treatments, um, I was getting lots of hormones and I was producing, I was 38 at the time and I was producing a lot of eggs, but uh, somehow uh, it always ended up either with uh, a miscarriage or non-pregnancy uh, at all. And when I started with uh, Dr. Cheng and Dr. Zhang, um, obviously, you know, I didn't produce as much um, uh, eggs, but I, I think it was like between three to five on each cycle. But the amount of blastocyst, which is uh, an embryo that reaches like its fifth or sixth day, was much higher. Um, so I, I knew that that, that mm -hmm. was definitely mm -hmm. the right technique for me. Um, I did go through a lot during this time. I had, I think, total like uh, five losses. Uh, I had gone through hysteroscopy and lassoroscopy. And you know, I have to give credit to Dr. Chen and Dr. Zen for being very creative with the way they treated me. Uh, with um, all sorts of uh, different uh, amount of hormones each time and all the uh, treatments that they had given me. And um, I gave birth uh, to my second child when I was 44 years old, and I yeah. think it's quite amazing. Yeah. I have a quick question for you. As a person who works hypnotically with people, and I can take someone with a needle phobia and get them through that with hypnosis, with acupuncture and with the treatments here, what advice would you have for the audience if there's a, a fear of needles or uh, inspiring them to, to use this methodology? Um, I also used acupuncture, by the way, <laughs> yeah. and there's a huge difference between uh, needles of an acupuncture yes. and needles <laughs> for, uh, for getting the they're hormones. Tiny. They're like yeah. little heads. You, yeah. you, yeah. 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 you don't even feel them. Yeah. You don't even feel them. Absolutely. Okay. You know, I, I didn't feel, uh, think of this treatment as invasive or hard to go through. Actually, it was pleasant. Yeah. You know, I was usually falling asleep uh, yes. during this treatment, so it was uh, my time for And myself. the retrieval? With the retrieval, you know, it required, I think, like maybe three injections every cycle. And and it was even just, I think, even one injection each each time. Uh, with my regular IVF, I remember I had to do like three every every day, yeah. like my leg, my thigh, my, my belly. Yeah. My, you know, there was one, I think, that even my husband had to give me. So yeah. um, it was yes. much more aggressive, much harder. I, you know, I, I got used to it because, you know, you want to have a child. You're going to do any, whatever you can in order to have this baby, but uh, it was definitely less stressful and uh, with um, new hope fertility. Okay, Absolutely. so we have time for one question from the audience and one from some social media person who's here. I don't know who that is, who's going to tell us. Okay, there we go. So a question from the audience for anyone up here on the panel? Yeah? We need a, a mic. <laughs> I think they're going to get you a mic. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Who's the question for? For Jill Brickway. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Um, what has your experience been? Uh, when when you tr sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, very what, good, what, well, thanks. What has your experience been uh, when 
when treating fertility patients in tandem with uh, Western biomedical physicians and the relationship between that and herbs when fertility drugs are being given? It's such a good question. I'm really glad you yeah. asked it, actually. Um, I, uh, the jury is very much out on combining herbs with fertility medication. Uh, we don't do it at our center, and the reason we don't is that someone like Dr. Chang is attempting to get feedback from blood work and things like that, and if we're giving you a substance he doesn't understand or know about, um, it's throwing all of that feedback off, and it, it affects his decision process. So it's like making him do IVF with one hand tied behind his back. So we try and get our herbal work done ahead of time. We like to see our patients three months before we get all of that done and we get them off before they um, they do their fertility meds and I think that's the safest way I don't think we do know how these um, the herbs um, combine with the medication and I think it's risky and, and unwise so in our center um, we we don't the only exception is someone who's been a very very low responder many times and then with the permission of the doctor and in close collaboration we might then give them herbs at the same time as they do their stims but that's a you know a special case and we're all communicating very well at that point this, this is where natural IVF actually may be very beneficial, yes. Yes, yes. because we, it's natural, and then we're not we're not trying to force anything from the, the doctor's standpoint. Mm -hmm. And this is where there's synergy between the. We the have discussed lives. the possibility of doing natural IVF with us doing the herbal stimulation, yeah. which I think would be really interesting, mm -hmm. and and doing a natural IVF at New Hope, which I think would be um, a really interesting way to go. Actually, mm -hmm. is there a question from social media? This one also is for you, Jill. We'll put you to work. Um, <laughs> how do, do you help when you, when a client or a patient comes into Unova? How do you help them figure out if they should stay seeking treatment from you on its own versus incorporating Western medicine in as well? Yes, it's usually um, uh, pretty obvious, but I do think patients have a lot of choices and it can get very overwhelming. And I do see it as part of my job to kind of cut those down a bit. You don't have to do everything. Um, at all, you know, you don't have to have a trainer and a therapist and a coach, and a, you know, you, you, it, it's, it's usually when I talk to patients, fairly obvious what they need. The longer I've practiced, and I've practiced a long time now, Helen and I have known each other a long time, um, th the more quickly I actually refer people out to see a Western doctor. I see no reason why we shouldn't get diagnosis very early. I don't want to think that I treat someone and waste their money and then find out they have blocked tubes and um, I didn't know and everything we were doing was never going to result in a baby anyway. That is not something I, I, I want for my patients. So I have a tendency to refer out for diagnosis um, really pretty quickly um, because I like to know what's going on myself. Mm -hmm. We can take another question from the audience. There's someone here. Yes. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Chang. Um, I, I attended several seminars in the morning where they were talking about uh, um, genetic testing. Do you do that in your uh, facility? Yes, we do. It's um, genetic testing is pretty much the wave of the future. Obviously, if you know what the embryo is before going in, you're going to have success. Now, there's a lot of limitations with genetic testing, which uh, hasn't really been brought up. You need a tremendous number of embryos to be able to test to, in the first place to be able to find that perfect embryo. <coughs> this is great when you are a person under 35 with a very, very good reserve. But for a woman in her 40s who's only making one or two eggs a month, to find those perfect embryos, to be able to collect enough embryos to find that perfect embryo, may take years to, so that there's a lot of limitations to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to the younger age group, it probably is the wave of the future and something that's going to be, I wouldn't be surprised, standard of care within the next two, three years. Mm -hmm. Is there another social media question? Okay, then we we can take we can take the what? Okay. Okay. So, so just in terms of wrapping up, uh, it's so nice to know, I'm sure for people like you, that uh, you don't have to go uh, into all kinds of heroics. That you can really just uh, trust that your body knows how to be a man, a woman, a couple. And uh, I'm reminded of the. Um, uh, the thyroid, how when you give Synthroid for the thyroid, the thyroid goes to sleep. It doesn't, it doesn't think it needs to do anything anymore. And I think what you're doing is you're bringing out the fertility that's, that's still there. So uh, I was particularly pleased to be part of this panel. 
Uh, it certainly is the work that I do from a different angle. Uh, and before I read what I have to tell you about the Fertility Planet uh, Conference, I just want to say that if you want a guarantee of coming back into your body, I'm running a, um, a mindfulness retreat in Costa Rica. I have some material up here you might be interested in. But in the meantime, you can contact any of the speakers on fertilityplanet.com. You can watch these sessions on the Fertility Planet uh, on the website starting tomorrow. Thank you to Fora.tv for the social media connection. Thank you to uh, Dr. Chang Jill and Anat for participating. And thank you to the sponsoring of this session. Uh, and uh, thank you for the uh, audience participation and attending this session. Uh, if you want to continue being involved here, Facebook and Twitter, hashtag FP13NY. And that's it. <laughs>